Right, hi everyone. Um, thanks for the intro. I'm Tom, so I'm pretty new to the blockchain space. I started working in the blockchain back in November. Before that, I led the engineering team at Zesty, which was a YC startup which was acquired by Square earlier this year. And before that, I did a PhD in quantum computing, which was a very long five years of my life. Um, so at Magmo, we are a state channel research and development team. Um, we've recently published the Force Move Games framework. Um, hands up if you've heard of this. Not very many. So this, this is not the crypto paper of the year. Um, in fact, it's probably not even the state channel paper of the year. It's probably almost definitely one of the top five state channel papers published this year. That's about as much as I can say about it. Anyway, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about this in this talk. Um, so for the structure of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about payment channels. Um, and I'm going to go over the basics of what a payment channel is. And then I'm going to explain how state channels are different from payment channels. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Force Move game framework and how that can be used for building state channel applications. Um, OK. So in order to explain payment channels and state channels, um, I'm going to introduce some new friends. So it's customary to use Alice and Bob in these situations, but like, I figure that they could do with some time off. So I've introduced three new characters here for you. And I've tried to make it the names easy to remember the characters by. So here's Matt. How do you remember that that's Matt? Yeah, so that's Matt in the hat. How do you remember that one's Tess? Yep. And how do you remember this one's Jude? Jude's in the nude. <laughs> OK, so we're going to have a little bit of a test, because I know it's like mid-session after lunch. Everyone's probably asleep. So we'll start off. Who's this? OK, let's try a bit more. Come on. Let's get some energy in this room. Who's that? Who's this? Who's this? That one? Well done. OK. So now let's get on with the explanation of payment channels. Um, so payment channels have been around for some time. I'm just going to do a quick recap of how they work, because a lot of the patterns that are used in payment channels are also used in state channels. Um, so a payment channel interaction starts. So we have Matt, we have Tess. They want to transact with each other off-chain, and they're going to be doing a lot of transactions. They're going to be doing like hundreds of transactions. They want to do those transactions very quickly. And so it's not going to be feasible for them to do all their tra transactions on chain. So the way they start off their payment channel is they put their, their coins into an on-chain contract. So left is on-chain, right is off-chain. And so they have their coins in this contract, which I'm going to be calling the adjudicator. Once those are there, they can start exchanging agreements about how those coins should be split at the end. So this first agreement says, Five goes to Tess, five goes to Matt. Matt sends that to Tess. He signs it. That's his signature at, at the end there. And Tess replies with the same state signed with her signature. So now they both hold signed states that they've both agreed that the funds in the chain are going to be split 5-5. Five, five. So what happens next is Tess wants to update the state. So maybe Matt bought something for her, and she wants to let him know that like, um, it's now 4-6. So she sends a state over to him. He echoes back the same state with his signature on it. So they're now at a new state. They've both agreed that the, new, the funds are now going to split 4, 6. And they can do this many, 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 many times. And at the end, say they've done 99 turns in this case, they want to go to the chain and they want to get those funds back. So it's finished up that it's 8 to Tess and 2 to Matt. So one of those presents that contract to the adjudicator on chain, and that starts a timer. Um, so that timer starts ticking. When the timer has resolved, they can then split the coins according to the final state that they presented to the blockchain. So let's have a look at the, the common features here, um, which will be common to all the state channel stuff and payment channel stuff that I talk about today. So we've got an on-chain deposit. We've got off-chain messages, which are versioned. And we've got on-chain settlement after a timeout. So that timeout is crucial to making the system secure. Why is that timeout important? Well, let's have a look at this situation again. So in the final state, Tess had eight and Matt had two, whereas in the second state, Matt had four. So it would be advantageous for Matt at this point to try and cheat 
and present state number two instead of state number 99. So if he does that, he takes state number two, gives it to the blockchain. The blockchain doesn't know that's not the last state at this point. So it starts the timer, the timer starts ticking, and Tess has that time to respond. She can send the later state there, and then the contract can tell it wasn't the later state. It just compares the version numbers, and it cancels that challenge and resets, resets um, the state to how it was before. So, that, so in all these systems, the timeout is key. You need to give someone a time to like, challenge the state. That's actually also shared by Plasma and, and a load of other off-chain solutions. So that was a very basic payment channel. I'm now going to talk about hash time lock contracts. Um, so hash time lock contracts are the way that payment channels become useful. Because at the moment, the only thing you can do with a payment channel is do loads of payments with one person. But it's actually quite unlikely that you want to do that. It's very rare that you want to do hundreds of transactions with just one person. You more like want to do hundreds of transactions with different people. And you don't want to do an on-chain deposit with every single one. You really want to do one chain on-chain on deposit and enable loads of off-chain transactions. So this is where hash time lock contracts come in. I'm going to do a very quick review of hashes. So we have these two things. We have x and we have y. And they're related by y is the hash of x. And you can undo that, or you can rewrite that statement by saying x is the inverse hash of y, or the pre-image of y under the hash function. And the point is that the hash function is very easy to do, and the inverse function is very hard to do. Um, so the only way you can provide x is if you knew x and you hashed it to get y originally. Um, so the way we add hash time lock contracts to payment channels is to add an extra kind of statement into the chain payment channel. So, so far, we only saw things where you had five to test, three to mat. Now we can have two to this hash time lock um, condition. And you think about that as a conditional payment. So, mat will send two to test if the inverse hash is revealed before a given time. So, you think of it as putting a locked payment in the payment channel. Um, and when the key is revealed, it becomes the real payment. So you can make that payment conditional on the revealing of the hash pre-image. Um, and this enables multi-hop payments, which is what makes payment channels really exciting, because it allows you to do one on-chain deposit and pay anyone connected in the payment channel network. This is what Lightning does. This is what Raiden is doing. So very quick look at this. So we've now got Jude. Jude wants to transact with Tess. That Jude has an on chain contract with Matt, and Matt has an on chain contract with Tess. So Jude starts by generating his random x, hashes that to, collect, to calculate y, puts his hash conditional payment in the channel with Matt. Matt puts a conditional payment in the channel with Tess. Tess is like, I see the payment, it's here. Somebody's going to give me the two ether you want to send me if somebody reveals the hash, the pre image. So so Jude is like, here's the key. Tess unlocks her payment. And in doing that, she gives Matt exactly the information he needs to unlock his payment. So we've managed to connect these two payments in a way that they're atomic. Like, we reveal the hash, the pre-image the hash, and then they both go through or neither of them go through. And that's what enables payment channel networks. So that's a very, very brief overview of payment channels. I'm now going to talk about state channels and how you can think of state channels as a generalization of payment channels and in what way that's true. Um, so the first concept of a state, the first step towards a state channel is actually just introducing conditional payments. So in fact, we already had a conditional payment in payment channels. We had mass, Matt sends two to Tess if, if, oh dear, two ifs, never mind if the pre-image, the hash, is um, revealed before time t. Um, state channels can generalize that by making more conditions possible. So for example, we can make the payment if England win the 2022 World Cup, which will probably happen. Um, or, and, and, and just to say that, like, what I mean is like the way we'd make that actually feasible is we'd pick an on-chain oracle that we're going to trust with that result, and then in 2022, either the payment happens or it doesn't. Um, so we could also make it conditional on Bob winning a game of chess being played at a given contract address. 
and you'd have to tell the payment channel how to understand who'd won. But like, that's a well-defined thing that can happen. Or, and this is where it begins to get even more exciting, is if Bob wins an off-chain game of chess played with a given ID. So the idea there is like, even though we're playing this game off-chain, we could put it on-chain, and then we can make that a, a um, condition on the payment going through. Um, and then, of course, we can join all these conditions with like Boolean logic. So we can begin to make arbitrarily complicated conditions um, for payment channels. So this is like almost a state channel network in itself. It, you can almost do arbitrary state channels. And I think this is basically what the seller network does. Um, but don't completely quote me on that, because I don't completely understand it. But like, this seems to be like these conditional payments. You can do almost everything you need to do with conditional payments. Um, but you can also take it a step further. Um, so with the conditional payments, we'd defined how much was moving and where it was moving to beforehand. And then we were just giving a condition about whether that payment should go through or not. So we can actually do something more general in that you can make a delegated payment, which is a term that I'm just using for this. I don't know if there's an actually, actually accepted term. But there you have a statement of the form we're going to send money to an address that's going to be determined, for an amount that's going to be determined, for a condition that's going to be determined. And all of those conditions could be looking at some something on chain. So it could be like, I will send an amount according to the exchange rate of ETH to some other token at that given point in time. Um, the address could also be something else. Most likely, what you'd have is one contract which determines all three of these values. Um, and to give a quick example of that, um, how this could work, I'm going to give the example of virtual channels. Virtual channels is to state channels what hash-locked um, payment networks are to payment channels. So what virtual channels allow you to do is if we've got this pair of people with an on-chain adjudicator and an on-chain deposit and an um, open channel, then we can allow the two people at the edge to construct a new channel, a virtual channel, without any on-chain payments. And it's really exciting, because that, that channel is like any other channel in that they can do arbitrarily, arbitrary things in here, including supporting new channels, including playing chess, including anything you might normally do in a state channel. So this is like, this, this work here was actually published earlier this year by Perun, which is a team out of Darmstadt and Warsaw. Um, this is really exciting, because this makes state channels really exciting. It means that state channels, you could have interactions in applications where I want to play a game with you. I can open the channel off chain. I can play the game. And I can close the channel off chain. So you could do entire actions off chain, like playing a game of chess, backed up by the chain. Let me quickly show you how this works. I think I'm running out of time. So the way that would do is you'd put delegate agreements. So they had five, five channels. They agreed to allocate 10 of their funds, delegated on delegated to the outcome of this channel. Um, so then uh, Jude and Tess um, do loads of interactions in that channel. In this case, it's just a payment channel. They come up with 299. Then they update these channels to reflect that. Notice that Matt, who put in 5, 5 on each arm to start with, has ended up rebalancing his funds. So he's still got 10 back, but he's taking 8 from the arm with Jude two with the arm from Tess, and he's allowed them to rebalance. So you can rebalance off-chain. Um, so um, that was state channels. I'm going to very, very quickly whiz through what force move games are. So when we were looking at these things which you can delegate to, there are certain rules about them that you have to follow. So like, if the thing that you delegate to might never finish, then you're in trouble. Like you need a way of forcing that to finish. Or like if my opponent goes offline and I can't like close out that delegate game, that's also a problem because I've like locked my money forever. So what the force move game framework does is it gives you a safe way of building little state off-chain interactions that are safe to delegate to. So like you can delegate to many things, but force move games gives you a way of building things that are safe to delegate to. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is like how you would say, play rock, paper, scissors. The basic idea here is that instead of sending states of balances, you're sending signed bundles of um, attributes that represent the state in your game. 
And you can think of your game, therefore, as a state machine. So when you're making a force move game, what you do is you define a set of states and a set of transitions between the states that define the interactions that you can take off chain. And the force move game handles all the stuff about challenging and making sure the game will finish. Um, so writing one of these things, you just write a game library with a valid transition function. It looks a bit like this. Um, and we have a proof concept that we're working on at the moment where we're building the game of rock, paper, scissors on the force move game framework, including all the user interface stuff. So this is a work in progress, but we're doing it in the open. If you want to have a look, have a look on GitHub, follow us along. You can see us like thrashing around and making a mess of it and maybe even help us out and point us in the right direction. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, you can find more about it at magmo.com. And the work so far has been funded by James Fickle and L4. So many thanks to them. Thank you. Awesome.